Well, hey everybody, Tom Berry here, and uh, I am excited to finally be able to talk about the Equity Fund Class B. This will be our second uh, shopping center purchase in what we hope to be a long series of those. And um, you know, it's been seven months since our last one. We closed on Dayton, Tennessee about seven, seven and a half months ago. And I know a lot of you thought, man, I was just gonna be churning these things out every month or so but I want you to understand it is very very difficult to find a property that meets all of our criteria and makes it all the way through the due diligence process and I'll talk a little bit more about that criteria and the due diligence process as we go along but I'd like to share our investment summary with you um, this property is called mainland crossing and as you can see here the address of it it's in Texas City Texas which I ironically is exactly where Melissa and I live. We live less than a quarter of a mile from this property as the crow flies and about a, a one mile um, by vehicle. So this is a property we know very well. We drive by it every single day and um, we have been negotiating and working on this deal for uh, probably three or four months now and have finally got it to a point where we feel comfortable uh, sharing it with you. So this one will be called the Equity Fund Class B and this center uh, will have an all-in cost of about $16 million, and I'll share the breakdown with you of those dollars in a minute. The purchase price will be $15,375,000, um, and something that I don't have on here is that we'll be getting about $180,000 back at closing from that fifteen three seventy five dollars to help us with some immediate, uh, in, or initial we call it, uh, capital uh, repairs. The uh, acquisition cost uh, estimated is going to be roughly $69,000. That's all the fees and things that we have to pay uh, when we purchase a property. That would be the appraisal and the phase one study and any lender costs. Uh, all of those things uh, would be in that line. Acquisition fee paid to Right Phase Real Estate, which is our sister company, of 1%. And, you know, last time when we did Dayton, Tennessee, uh, I had two people ask me, what is, you know, why do you get paid 1% in acquisition fee when you buy these things? Didn't seem like you have all of that much time and effort in this particular project. And that's a very fair question and a very fair statement, and it's, it's totally true and accurate. But when you look at what an acquisition fee is, it's not the time and effort that our team puts into bringing this particular deal to you. It's the time and effort that we put into analyzing hundreds and hundreds of other deals that you never saw because they never made it all the way through the process. So don't look at the, um, don't look at the acquisition fee as a fee covering us finding this particular deal. Look at it as the fee that covers all the due diligence we do on all the deals that we have to do in order to get to this one. Um, Initial capital reserves, we put 414000 aside for initial capital reserves. Um, minimum investment on this project is going to be $100,000. Estimated hold time, five years. Um, and look, I always say five years, but if it's three, if it's four, that's great. Uh, I've just never seen a cycle that lasted longer than five where we could not exit at a really strong price uh, sometime within that five years. Target rate of return to investors, I would say on the lower end of that is where I want to keep your expectation. However, I'm going to share with you some things that could happen. Say, could happen that could really push that up. But without any of those things, I'm very comfortable saying 20, very comfortable. So 
Next up, we have property overview. This is a very large center, for us anyway. Um, our Rockport Center is about 90,000 square feet. The Dayton, Tennessee Center is about 110,000 square feet. And this one is just shy of 130,000 square feet. It will make it the largest property that we've purchased to date and the largest price paid for a property to date. However, that being said, it's also the best location we have bought to date. And I'll get into the location here uh, on this particular slide. This property uh, is part of a larger center that used to be all one. I don't know the exact square footage of the entire center, but I, if I were to estimate it, I would estimate it at somewhere around 200,000 square feet. Two sections have been cut off of the center, and on this slide you'll see a picture. And just to the left side of the picture, you can just see that those blue roofed buildings, which is our subject property, are attached to another building that it looks like it's brick front, brick faced. And it is. That is actually a county building. It was sold to the county years ago. So uh, Galveston County, Texas has some of its offices in there. And then further to the left out of that picture uh, is a large building that Farmers Copper owns. And again, that was cut off years ago. And uh, that has, those have both been occupied by those, uh, we call them owner occupants, uh, for years and years. The rest of the center has these little blue awnings over all the roofs, and that's what we're purchasing. And that is 129,679 square feet, plus or minus. Um, this is a very heavily dense, densely populated area. It is not like Dayton, Tennessee or Rockport, Texas. Both of those centers are in populations of about 10 to 11,000 in each town. This is in Texas City, Texas, with a population of roughly 60,000, but it is part of the major metropolitan area of Houston Sugarland Woodlands, which is a population count of over 6 million. So this is part of a major metro area, and this is not the type of property we will typically be able to get. Um, most generally, Metroplex properties are going to trade at a lot lower cap rates than what we're willing to spend. So the idea that we're going to find something in an Atlanta or a Tampa or a Dallas or a Phoenix, uh, is, we don't even look in those areas, to be quite honest, um, other than a casual glance, because they're priced a lot higher than in the tertiary or rural markets that we have uh, found to be very comfortable for us. So the idea that we found this metro property um, and still within our purchasing guidelines uh, has been very exciting. This sits on uh, just shy of 20 acres. It's 19 and a half acres. I'll get into that a little bit later as we go on in the presentation. Um, I'm not going to read you every word in this. Uh, you can obviously read through everything, but I do want to point out things that maybe are not uh, spelled out here. For example, the second paragraph on this one talks about Texas City's Lago Mar subdivision. This is a 2,000 acre master plan subdivision that is not more than two miles from this particular property. Um, it's pro I don't know the build out right now. It's probably over 60% built out, but still has a lot more growth to go. And that is going to be one of the feeders for the tenants in this particular building. You know, the way retail usually is done is they always say you put the roofs up first, then the retail. Roofs and retail. The roofs, meaning houses, house roofs. And then you put the retail to match. So if you have so many houses, you need so many square foot of retail space. This particular property was not built in that order. It was built 
in a time when malls were built outside of town and everybody went out there to do their business and the downtowns were really devastated by it. And there is a mall right across the street from this particular property and both the mall and this center suffered greatly when the internet marketing boom started happening. Well, the mall has been completely bought piece by piece and repositioned or redeveloped into other purposes and is now completely full. It is completely occupied and doing very well. This adjacent property was in the same way when the developer found it. And by the way, it's the same developer that redeveloped the mall right across the street. He bought this at about 30 to 40% occupancy. He bought it for a song and then he went in and redeveloped it just like he did the mall across the way. Now it's completely occupied, 100% occupancy. And as a developer, he's not really into running things long term and is not really well positioned to do it well. So once he gets it full, he wants to sell it, move on to the next project and redevelop the next thing and the next thing and so forth. So it's become a very, um, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to be able to come in on a project at this phase. I'll talk about the different phases here in just a moment as well. On a map, you can see that the property is in the Galveston County, um, but part of the Houston metro area. And um, we are not on Galveston Island, just off the island, which is why this is called Mainland Crossing. Most everything in Texas City is called mainland something. Um, just to denote that, yeah, we're in the county, but we're not out on the island. <laughs> Other pictures here, uh, I've just kind of talked to you a little bit already about the background on this property. So the big opportunity on this property is in something called rehabbing the leases. What a lot of people don't know about true commercial real estate is that there are three things that make up the value of that real estate. The, the physical property is one of them and that makes up uh, I don't know the exact percentages, but we'll call it a third of the value of the property. So the physical asset itself would be, when was it built? What type of construction is it? Um, what kind of condition is it in? Is it in a high traffic area? Is it in a high population area? What is the um, household income in a one mile, three mile, five mile radius? All of those things would be included in what I call the physical attributes of the asset. And that makes up about a third of the, of the value. The next third would be made up by something called the tenant mix. Now the tenant mix is who are your tenants and how strong are they? And how long have they been there? Or how long have they been in business? What does their credit look like? Um, do they have multiple stores? Are they publicly traded? Uh, and then they're also looked at, is it a national credit tenant? Is it a regional credit tenant? Or is it a mom and pop with one location and, you know, one, one, one bad thing in their life could devastate the business and create a vacancy? The third thing that makes up the value of a, a true commercial property is what are the lease structures? What do those leases look like? And there's where the opportunity here is. The physical attributes of this property are phenomenal. I'll go through them all here as we go through. The tenant mix is solid as can be. Um, we've, again, I'll go through that in a later slide. But the real opportunity is the leases suck. The leases are horrible. And that's a good thing for us because we know how to rehab a lease. So when I say the leases suck, what I mean is that they're not very long term. These leases most generally have about four years, five years to them. We like to offer people 10 year, seven year, and so forth. And we can do that because we write something called triple net leases. This developer, he doesn't do triple net leases. He doesn't really understand that. Uh, all he knows is filling a property with good tenants. 
And he's done that. He's done a good job at it. So what we're going to do on the renewals of each of these leases is we're going to convert them to triple net leases. Now, why would somebody not use triple net? Well, the first reason is they don't know how it works. The second reason is they don't know how to explain it well to a tenant, and a tenant just won't do it if they don't understand why there's a benefit to them to do a triple net lease over a gross lease. So we have gross lease, that's, that's the worst kind of lease in commercial. Look at it as gross is gross. You don't, you don't want gross leases in commercial. The next one up would be a single net, then a triple net, a double net, and then a triple net. And then there's even one further up the chain called an absolute net. So that would be kind of the chain. We're taking a property that has mostly gross leases and a few net leases in there, and we're going to try to push as many of them as possible during our whole period up to triple net. Now, we have a track record with it in our Rockport property, which we've owned for a, going on two years, um, we have had multiple gross leases expire or come up for renewal that we were able to convert to triple net. And we have a very good system of going in and doing that, even with mom and pop tenants that quite honestly in Rockport, it was ran by professionals that knew about triple net, they just weren't able to explain it properly to an unsophisticated tenant. Once we got that piece in place, we were able to start converting all of our lease renewals in Rockport to triple net. In fact, we're at 100% so far. We've not had any refuse to renew because we were converting them to a, a triple net lease. Um, I had talked earlier about the second third um, of the value of a property being the tenant mix. And this is something I really like about this property. The, this thing has a breakdown of wholesale supply, 29% of the uh, leasable area. Restaurant bar, 13%. Fitness and entertainment, 8%. Health and beauty, 5%. Retail, 5%. So here we are with 130 almost thousand square feet of retail center with only 5% of it actual retail stores. It's two tenants, Rainbows and the Vape Shop. That's it. The rest of it really is not true retail. 7% is professional services. Medical makes up 22% of it. Education, 8%. And a church takes 4%. So this is a very strong tenant mix with some really, really solid tenants in here. Now, I might also add, a lot of these tenants are newer in this building, but they're not new. For example, UTMB Health is new to the building, but the University of Texas Medical Branch is not a new business by any stretch. That is owned by the University of Texas University System. Um, there's um, one of the entertainment centers in the building um, is a wrestling training center. They also actually have wrestling matches that are televised. Now, it's an odd business. I've never seen one before, but I know the track record of that business. They've been in business for over five years across the street at the mall, and the developer was able to sell their building to the county, so he moved them from there over to this building. So on our rent roll, it shows that they're a newer tenant, but they're really not a new business. They just moved so they could get more room. He offered them more room, more expansion opportunity, and it got them out of the building that he was wanting to sell to the county at a premium. So these businesses, when you look at the rent roll, don't be scared by their start dates because a lot of them are um, very established businesses. 
So now, another value add that we have on this, and again, I'm going to call it potential. It's not baked into the numbers I'm going to share at the end, but there is the potential. You see the big red arrow there? That is pointing to a very large piece of ground out at the end of the parking lot that can be, we believe, carved off for outlots. And an outlot is where you would either sell a chunk or you would ground lease a chunk or you would build to suit on a chunk of that extra vacant ground out there that's not being used. So it could be a, a fast food restaurant, it could be another strip for retail, it could be a variety of things. Um, we are currently working with a company that does uh, those new tunnel car washes. We're doing a, a survey to see if that would be a good location for one. I actually believe it would be because I live right there and we have to drive all the way into town to get to the nearest good car wash. Um, so. I think that, that area is going to be a, a perfect opportunity, but that's not for me to decide. We'll have, a, we'll have a feasibility study done to see if it would be a good place for that. Um, but those are just examples of the things that we're already looking at as a way to add more value to this property. We were, have been able to carve off uh, outlots in Dayton, Tennessee. We just closed on one um, just in the last quarter for over uh, $1.1 million. We have another one that we have an option on, uh, and that would be another $550,000 if that option is exercised. And then in a Rockport property, we just got an offer on an outlot as well for uh, I think we're at roughly 400 and still under negotiation, but I think it, it's going to shake out at about 400,000 just for a tiny little piece of property to put a, a, a quick service restaurant on. So that's an opportunity here and we've probably got enough room for four. Uh, on this particular property because that that piece is really huge out there. So as you know, I am very bullish on retail centers, but I don't want a lot of retail in the center. I've talked about this on numerous videos. Retail is, now this is Marcus and Milchap's um, the CEO, his words, not mine, retail has been the comeback kid after around 10 years of restructuring because of e-commerce. I've said this in multiple videos and I'm going to say it again because it backs up the tenant mix in this particular property. You have a retail center of almost 30,000 square feet with only 5% of it actual retail. Why? Well, because a wrestling uh, training facility moved in. Because a wholesale supply house moved in and took 30,000 square feet. You have restaurants and bars that have moved into retail now. You have UTMB Medical Center has put a women and pediatric clinic in a retail center. So all of this retail space is getting gobbled up by businesses outside of the realm of retail and that's good for us because a lot of people today still think retail's dead and you know it's it's dead forever because of internet shopping it's google and amazon has put about a business no amazon beat them up vacated a lot of them but they are all filling back up in fact the average vacancy across the nation for retail centers is 5%. That means 95% of the retail space across the nation, all retail space, including malls, and a lot of them are half empty or a third full, and they're really pulling the number down. I think if you excluded malls, retail would fare even better, and it would probably come in at 2% occupant or 2% vacancy at most. So we've gone through this metamorphosis in the retail space. I don't think a lot of people have got that memo and that has created a great opportunity for us. Um, oh, I've got to go back two slides here. Um, where the red arrow is, I wanted to add one more thing. You see that big lake right behind, on the opposite side of the freeway there. That is Delaney Lake and Melissa and I actually live on that lake. So that is how close we live to this property. Where the 
arm of the arrow is sticking up and where you see, just underneath the uh, Amazon delivery station, that's where our house is. So why is that important? Well, I think it is a huge benefit to have me particularly living so close to this property. And not because I'm gonna have an eagle eye on it, of course I am, and Melissa will, and our whole family will be looking at this property every time we drive by it. But the most important thing is we have boots on the ground, experienced boots on the ground, really close to this property. And it's gonna make managing this much, much easier for us. Um, easier in this way. The hardest part of managing a property like this remotely is finding good trades, finding good contractors when you need one for the property. I'm not gonna have an issue with that on this one. When Alex, our property manager and my assistant, uh, emails me and says, hey, we need this done at Malin Crossing, I'm gonna know who to call. I'm gonna know who to send out there to that particular property. And we have not known that in Dayton and Rockport. It has been a little bit more of a challenge. We've still been able to find great trades in every place we've gone, and we just start making a list of all the people we like to deal with. But make no mistake, there are also people we find that we put on the other list of people we didn't like dealing with and we don't wanna call them again. I don't think we're gonna have as many on that list with Mainland Crossing simply because of our proximity and our resources and our contacts in this particular area. So just another little benefit. Also on this picture, you can see the two other buildings that are attached to our building that I'd talked about earlier, and that's Farmer's Copper. Actually, Farmer's Copper is not attached. It's right beside it, but it used to be all part of the same one. And then that great big building there that is the Galveston County um, Center as well. Okay, so 100% occupied, long-standing, great mix of national, regional, and local-based tenants. Um, most of these leases are gross or gross modified, and um, leases range from three to six years. Uh, some of them have rent bumps during option periods and so forth, but the big opportunity here for us, uh, and current NOI is one and a half million a year. That puts us in this thing at a 10 cap, 10.10 to be exact. Um, we have a strong traffic count, best traffic count of anything we've ever bought. Uh, 40,000 vehicles per day on the Emmett Lowry Freeway right in front of this center. Um, purchase price is about a buck 18 a foot, and um, that puts it well under replacement cost. Well, well under replacement cost. Again, the big opportunity on this property is take care of these tenants, make sure they love us and they love that building, and convert those leases to triple net as they come up for renewal. Of course, with rent bumps, and we've been very, very successful at bumping rents on renewal. Uh, we've got a system in place for doing that. We give the tenants options, and that's how we've been able to do it. We give them the best rates that we intend to give them, still with bumps, on 10-year 10 year renewals, and then a little less of a good deal on seven, a little less of a good deal on five, a little less of a good deal on three, and we don't offer anything under three. And three is bumping the rents by 20%. So nobody takes the three. If they do, okay. That just boosted the NOI, and we start marketing that property because we know at the end of three, we might have a space available. We want those people to take the tens and the sevens and the fives. Those are the ones we want them to take and they're priced accordingly. But by giving them an option, no isn't one of the options. It's do you want a 10, a seven, a five, or a three? And uh, thus far, everybody has chosen one of those options. Development of the outlots, I can't stress that enough. That is a huge 
opportunity. Again, I did not bake that into um, any of the numbers. And if you do any research on Galveston County or Texas City or Lago Mar, you will find this is a rapidly growing area, the fastest growing area we've been able to buy uh, an asset in to date. Um, forecasts, I'm not going to read all of this to you. There's the demographics. I've tried to include all the statistics that you might ask for. And here's the site plan, which shows the exact layout of the property and all the tenants and where they're located in each of their respective suites. Here we have the rent roll with the name of the uh, tenant, industry classification, business type, square footage, price, all of that right across there, lease start dates, end dates, and so forth, and income and expense projections. Now, these projections are based on information that we have gathered from the seller and our knowledge of what these numbers should be based on our ownership of two other properties. So oftentimes, um, how should we say? Sellers will give you incomplete or inaccurate information and we will extrapolate uh, where we see those anomalies and plug in what we think it should be based on our knowledge of other properties of similar class. Our deal analysis formula, as I always will, I want to put in uh, in front of you in this uh, review how we came up with our numbers that we're sharing with you. Um, so you've seen the income and expense. The income is directly coming off the rent roll, which I've shared with you. The rent roll comes right off the site plan and so forth. Well, this is the last step for us in the analysis. And that is to take that NOI and plug it in. And as I've said before, anytime you're looking at a fund or syndication, the thing that you wanna ask the sponsor or fund manager is, what were your assumptions? Because with different assumptions, I can make a deal look any way I want it to look as a fund manager or a sponsor. And that sounds horrible, but there are guys that will manipulate numbers just to get a deal done. Why would they do that? This might be a good place to, to talk about that. A lot of fund managers and syndicators make their money off of transactions. The more transactions they do, the more money they make to eat on. They don't actually make money off the profitability of the properties they're buying. I, I know guys right now that are buying properties at a six cap, 6% 6 cap rate, and they're raising capital to do it. They have to, okay, because that that deal does not cash flow when rates are around 8% on a commercial loan right now. So when you're buying at a negative cap rate to the interest rate on your mortgage, it can't make money. That, that, that math doesn't work. So what they'll do is they do a bunch of deals and they pack their deals with acquisition fees and management fees and fund management fees and disposition fees and they do a lot of deals, and that's how they make their living. And I want you to understand, we do not do that. You saw we do have an acquisition fee, 1% acquisition fee, but we will go through hundreds of deals over the last seven months to be able to find one that works. We have a fund management fee of 1%. That's 1% of the capital invested. Here's another caveat to assumptions. Don't ever assume that a 1% fund fee and a 1% fund fee are equal. You should also ask, 1% of what? Now, a lot of them will say 1% of the assets under management, AUM. Well, what is the asset under management? This particular property is a $15 million property. So am I charging 1% on the 15 million? Well, a lot of them will, yes. We don't. We're charging 1% on the partner capital managed. And in this case, that's 5,250,000. So a big difference. We're getting a third 
of what some of the other guys would get. So I like sharing all the assumptions right here on this page. And Donald and Alex built this for me. It was a joint effort. So that all I have to do is plug in the information in the yellow spots. The rest of it auto calculates for me. So we know what the NOI is because we can see that on the um, two slides back. <coughs> we know what the purchase price is. We have a contract. That calculates price per square foot. I have, here's my assumption. My first assumption is annual NOI increase. How much can I increase the net operating income of this property over a five-year hold? And most generally, I use 2%. On this one, I went even more conservative and said 1.5%. I know I can do that. I'm almost positive. I can't use the word guarantee, but I am really, really positive that 1.5% is very conservative. Um, CapEx, I've put 2% on an annual basis, meaning we're putting aside 2% every year for other capital improvements. Now, we've got some initial capital improvements we're going to do, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. But outside of that, I don't see any more on the horizon. Um, but you know what, it's a piece of real estate. There will always be something that comes up. So we're setting aside 2%. That is way over industry average, but I wanna be conservative there. Closing costs, the assignment fee we talked about earlier, uh, or due diligence fee. Acquisition costs, we talked about that uh, on the first slide. Initial CapEx. So what is initial CapEx? That is the amount of money I'm setting aside to do some work right out of the gate. And on this particular property, the work right out of the gate is that we need to re-roof about 95,000 square feet of this. The one section on the south end of the property was already re-roofed when they moved in the sports bar and the uh, Vetra supply tenant. Those took up roughly 40,000 square feet. So we got about another 90, 95,000 square feet to go. And when we had our roofing inspection done, there was no question whatsoever. We don't even want to run with this roof a year. We just want to go in, immediately fix it, change it out, and move on. However, I have a quote to do it for $330,000. And I went back to the seller and said, you need to pay for half of it. So he will be reimbursing half of that at closing to help us pay for that re-roof. So within let's say 60 to 90 days of us closing on this property, we will have 100% of it with brand new roofs on. And that is phenomenal. This roofing material typically lasts 20 years. We will not have to mess with the roofing gutters or downspouts because we're redoing them all. Uh, shouldn't ever have to touch any of them within our ownership period. Hey everybody, I wanted to cut in uh, with a quick update. When I originally did the video for the Equity Fund B, uh, I talked in this segment about what I thought the lender was going to offer for our debt piece on the financing. Now I actually have hard numbers and so I wanted to share that the lender that we're going to use on this is actually the same lender that lent on our Park Row office building and on the Dayton, Tennessee Equity Fund A project. Um, they like what we're doing so they wanted to do this deal. We showed them the deal. They came out, they looked at it, and they said, you know, they would do a certain amount and so forth. We bantered back and forth. And where we ended up is we're going to do 8% interest. It's going to be fixed for seven years, which basically means it's fixed for the life of our hold period because we expect our hold period to be around five years. So we wanted to make sure that we were locking an interest rate that can't go up on us during our ownership period on the property. Um, and it's going to be on a 30-year amortization, so it's going to really cash flow well. And we're going to do 70% of the purchase price, which once we get the appraisal in, we'll see exactly where that puts us in actual LTV. But we believe that that should put us somewhere in the mid-60% range uh, on 
loan to value uh, because obviously we're buying this property for less than what we believe it is currently valued at. Uh, I talked to the appraiser two days ago, that's an update as well, and he agreed with me. He thinks the value is much higher than what we're purchasing it at as well, though obviously he couldn't tell me how much uh, until he actually does a full-blown appraisal on it. So sorry for the break-in here, but wanted to give you that update with hard numbers rather than what we expected the numbers to be. ILS equity fund manager performance fee, 20%. That is our piece for putting this deal together and running the deal. The other 80% is the LPs, our investors. And we're always our first investor. So we will invest 10% of the capital needed and that has us putting $525,000 of our own money in the deal right along with yours. So we'll be in there for a half million. Uh, the other 30% will come from other investors, and that represents 4725000 And if you look at the last assumptions there, I am assuming a 60-month hold. I'm assuming we will sell it at an eight cap on sale. Now, <laughs> that is a ridiculously low, I'm sorry, that's a ridiculously high cap rate to put in there because I got to be honest with you, when we get done with what we intend to do, there is no, there's nothing in my mind that tells me that this sells for anything less than a seven to seven and a quarter cap. But again, I want to be very conservative with the numbers, so I put an eight cap. At an eight cap that has a selling it at just under $21 million, our remaining loan balance at that point would be 10 million, which cash after payoff would be 10 million 600,000. Going through all the rest of the numbers, you can look at that, and if you have any questions, you can get back to me. But partner share, that's the point that I want to make. The 70% partners, division of the profits, should calculate out to 22%, actually 22.592%. Now that is made up of two numbers, and I want to point them out for you. The first one is up in the TAN box, projected annual cash flow. That is what we believe we will be paying out on an annual basis, paying it out quarterly, obviously. And those numbers show that we should be able to pay out 8% annualized on a quarterly basis. The rest that makes up that 22.5% comes from the sale of the property, the appreciation, and selling it in the right market. We're buying it in the right market because commercial real estate is being beat up right now. Doesn't mean it's not worth as much, it just means people don't want to buy it. So that's the time we do want to buy it, the right property, in the right places, with the right things that we can fix and make it even more by pushing uh, appreciation. That's all I have on this. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, Tom at ILS.cash, Tom at ILS.cash. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. If that leads us to a telephone call, that's fine as well. We can certainly do that. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal property in an even more phenomenal area. I cannot stress that enough. We are not going to be able to find this type of property in this type of location very often. So I'm very, very excited about it. I hope you are too. And again, this is not a solicitation for investment uh, because it is not accompanied by a PPM subscription agreement and all the other offering documentation. No investment um, decision should be made without all of those things. Now, that disclaimer being said, Said, if you do have interest in learning more and getting all of that documentation so you can make a, a informed decision, please reach out to us. This is not an evergreen offering. This will be a closed offering, meaning the first money comes in, it goes on our spreadsheet, and once we hit our raise, we close it and we expect this will fill up very quickly. So if you have interest, reach out, get that information. Um, 
let us know kind of what you're thinking, how much you're thinking of putting towards it if you're, if you're thinking about it, so we can get you on that spreadsheet and get you a slot. And uh, as always, I'll see you on the next video.